The title of today's message is, What Does Color Matter? Okay. I paid some money for this shirt, believe it or not, online. And so I thought I'd wear it a second time before it goes back into the closet for, for whatever else God says to pull it out for. <laughs> so we're going to talk about color. We're going to talk about what God has to say about about this whole issue that's going on all over Facebook, all over social media, all over the news. No, you're not supposed to mix politics with religion. But when God says to say something, you say it. It's as simple as that. The concern that God has about this whole topic is simply why don't my kids just look past the skin color and appreciate the fact that I made each of them a little bit different? The, um, the college that Crystal and I went to in Berea, a lot of things, um, there were a lot of things that God taught me while I was there. One of the things that was engraved into uh, one of the walls at the college campus is this first scripture. And it's found in Acts chapter 17, and it's verses 26 through 27. They only took the first verse and put it on there. But we're going to read 26 and 27. The context to this is Paul is standing in front of a bunch of people in a city that doesn't know if they've got every single God covered. They have a bunch of statues, they have a bunch of places of worship in place, but then they have one called the unknown God just to cover themselves because they were so scared of not being able to um, honor the right God at the right time. They had one for the God of grain, the God of wind, the God of water, etc., etc. But then they said, just to cover ourselves, we're gonna have this one to the unknown God. So Paul and uh, the folks that were traveling with him took it upon themselves. God told them to do this. They said, all right, we're going to tell you who this unknown God is, and we're going to show you. So during that conversation that they had with him, they mentioned uh, in the first few verses prior to 26, they mentioned that uh, this unknown God is not one made of stone. This unknown God is not one made of wood. It's not one made by man's hands. This God, can you turn me down, please? This God is the one that created you. The one that created everybody. It's not the other way around. And so they had to remind them of that fact. So in verse 26, they point out, and he is made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. He has made of one blood all people. This is evidenced in two different places in scripture prior to Paul talking first one's obvious, Adam and Eve. First couple, one blood, boom, everybody's descending from them. But then the flood happened, wiped everybody out except for Noah and his kids and their family. Okay, so again, from one blood from there, even though it was filtered in from other um, genes earlier on, you still have one family populating the rest of the earth after the flood. Okay, still God made everybody with one blood. Still, the melanin concentration is a little bit different, just like our hair color is different, our eye colors are different, our height, our weight, our um, anything else is different. God did that for his reason. We don't know why Danny is as good at looking as I am, he, with the shirt or without. I mean, I, I don't know. God, God has a sense of humor, right? So, <laughs> he made us with one blood and he created us for those of you that you're curious this is a side message 
For those of you that are curious about why he made us, it spells it out right here too in verse 27. It says, so that we should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. He created us in his image for us to find him. He's not far. That's what it says right there. He's not far from every one of us. But we need to look for him. We need to ask where he's at. So if you ever wonder what purpose he created us for, it's to find him. And he's right there for you. Later on, in Galatians, I'm trying to find it here. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, Paul is writing here as well. Because at this time, the, the folks in Galatia were talking about how um, the Jews are better than the Gentiles because of the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Verse 26 through 29 says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So no matter what your background is, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior and you have that faith in there, you are children of God. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the same promise. Or to the promise. They were concerned about who's going to get the promise. Who's going to get the, the, the rewards of being a follower of Christ. The Jews were, they were saying, well, this is our promise. It's ours. Paul was reminding them, no, anybody else that came along and said, hey, I've accepted Christ and I want him to be Lord and Savior of my life as well. This is where they get to be inherent uh, heirs as well to the promise. No matter the background, Jew, Greek, slave, free, white, black, polka dotted, doesn't matter. Anybody that has accepted Christ can go ahead and expect the same um, inheritance according to the promise of Abraham that the Jews were so focused on at the time. So then, how are we supposed to react to, um, to events like in Charlottesville and Boston and some of these other things that have been going on in the last couple of weeks or so? Well, the simple answer is love. God created us in his image, right? We all have opportunity in our life to have anger. There are, a lot, there are opportunities in our life to where anger sometimes comes up. God also hates. You're like, what? God is love. Yes, God is love. But he also hates hates. The scripture specifically says what it is that he hates. We're created in his image, so we're supposed to follow suit with this. So, where is this place for hate? Spelled out of. It's in Romans chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Or in other words, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. I'm going to pause right here because the rest of that is going to carry forward here in a minute. The, the part that I want to focus on here is abhor what is evil or hate what is evil. Why does he want us to hate what is evil? Hmm? Because it's of the devil? So why, why do we associate evil with the devil? What is evil? Now we're getting into philosophy. What would you say? Hatred? Okay. A lack of God? Okay. Hmm? All manner of sin. Yes. All of these 
tying together very nicely because hate, I'm sorry, evil is simply anything that separates us from God. That's what sin is. That's the definition of sin. Evil is sin. Sin is evil. Anything that takes us away from the creator of the universe that made us in his image is evil. It's sin. That's why God hates it, because it's taken us away from him. He created us to seek him, right? We've already established that earlier. He doesn't want us to be drawn away from him. Susan's been teaching Sunday school lessons about the people in, in um, um, around Gideon. Yeah, thank you. Um, talking about how they keep getting drawn away from the one true God because they're focused on what they can see. God does not like it when that happens. The scripture specifically says he is a jealous God because he wants our attention. He doesn't want our attention to be drawn to something else or some other God, something to replace him. He created us to go after him, right? So anything that is evil or anything that is sin that draws us away, he hates. We're supposed to hate that as well. But how do we actually react? How, do, how are we supposed to hate anything like that? That's the question that a lot of Christians as well have had struggles with over the last couple of weeks, specifically. How do we react to incidents like Charlottesville? How do we react to incidents like what is going on over there in Boston and some of the other um, rallies and things like that? How are we supposed to react? We're not supposed to react with fire for fire, hate for hate. The scripture says specifically not to do that right here. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Not knocking them down. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Does it give a qualifier there saying, but if they're purple, don't cry with them. It's their own fault because their skin color is purple. No. It says weep with them because they weep. Sympathize with them. But at the same time, don't go down the crying train with them completely. You're there to help hold their hand. God gave us as missionaries. God gave us to reach out to those that need help. He wants us to be that steady hand for him. So yes, sit there, listen to what they're crying about, but help them out at the same time. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, in other words, anything in your control, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. It spells it out right there. Whether it's for the things going on right now politically or what went on during the uh, Boston Marathon a few years ago with the bombings and any other terrorist attack that happens, repay evil with good. That's how they see the difference. If we start getting into our carnal selves and start yelling back hatred, or yelling at them and calling them names, what makes us different? Nothing. That's not drawing folks to Christ. That's not having them see the light. That's having them see our carnal selves, the old man that we're supposed to not be a part of anymore. We're supposed to be in Christ, a new creation, a new creature, one that represents our Lord and Savior, and one that is actually supposed to be the hope 
for those that are watching us in every step that we make. That is what we're supposed to focus on. So um, after the event on Saturday, last Sunday night, there was an event here in Charleston. I don't know if you guys knew about it or not. There was a statue that was, it was down there on the Capitol ground. Uh, there was a statue that some folks were coming to watch or protest the incident that happened at Charlottesville, and they were talking about this statue over there, a Confederate soldier, um, Stonewall Jackson. There are many sides to the issue of these statues. There are many points to be listened to on these statues. But the point God wants to make today is how do you react to opposing viewpoints on these statues or anything else like this? When I watched, because I went online, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what some of those other viewpoints were. As you guys know, I'm not from the South originally. So my, my viewpoints on any of these topics are going to be a little bit different than what a lot of you might have, um, simply because of my background and simply because of your background. The, so I wanted to see what points were being brought up. When I got onto the Facebook site that they were advertising for this particular group that was organizing this rally, they, ha they were Facebook Live. So I said, oh, good, maybe I'll be able to hear some good stuff and figure out what these points are, because I didn't travel over there to see it. There were several pastors over there, several churches represented, and um, the general public was welcome. There were a lot of signs, a lot of signs talking about how much we don't want these uh, hate groups here in West Virginia, how we will not stand for hate, how we will not stand for all these other things that are going on. But right alongside it was a sign of hate as well. And it was, it was pointed, though, towards those hate groups. It had some foul language in it. It was, it was the F word. And it straight up said, no, I'm not going to say the word, but it straight up said, get out. We don't need you here. That was the gym version, the cleanup version, but it had expletives in it. That person didn't get up with the megaphone like the other folks did to say that they were Christians or they represented a church. So I don't know that person's background. But she was standing there with that sign that was her reaction, providing the same hate, the same evil for evil, yelling for yelling. I don't know that person. I don't know that person's background, like I said. So I don't know if she represents herself as one that is a Christian or if she's not. But that is not what we are supposed to do as Christians no matter how much we get angered over injustice or no matter how much we get angered over what we see as um, hate coming across. We are supposed to hate anything that separates people from God. But how do we do that? We show love. That's what the scripture is saying. We reach out. We can have conversations with people that have different viewpoints. We can sit down with them and say, this is, so where are you coming from? Why do you hate so-and-so because their skin color is different? Can you tell me what makes them so different from you or me because of this melanin? Can you tell me what's so different because they're taller than us or whatever? Whatever the difference is of the day. Talking to them sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It depends on how much that person is willing to to listen. Um, sometimes they have it ingrained in them from from uh, their young childhood because their parents and their grandparents taught them this particular mindset. Those are harder nuts to crack sometimes to get through, but not for God. God died for every one of us, including the hate groups, including the people involved in any of that. I've mentioned before, God died for Hitler just as much for you and me. He died for Osama bin Laden just as much as you and me. 
He died for any other person that you can think of that you think, no, of course not, he didn't do that. Yes, he did. What makes us better than that person in God's eyes? We're all his children. We all make our own decisions and make different actions, yes. But if we can focus on God's love and actually shining that love and sharing with those people, this is where we have the hope. This is who Christ is. That is what we need to be doing as missionaries. That is what we need to be doing in our backyard, our front yard, on the internet, when God leads us with the right words. Ask him for wisdom. Because chances are, if you just jump right in when you see something online and you start rattling off, it probably isn't going to be of God 100% of the time. Ask him for his words. Ask him if he wants you to say anything at all. Because sometimes I've put my foot out there. Pastor Paul mentions pastors aren't perfect. I'm not either. I've put my mouth out there and said something thinking this is innocent. And then it rattles up a whole hornet's nest. Ask for wisdom on whether you're supposed to open your mouth at all in the first place. Yes, we need to stand for what's right. We need to stand for what is godly. We need to stand for who Christ is to show people who he is and to give them that hope. But let him tell you how to do that. We can't physically grab somebody and say, you are winning, or I have just now won you for Christ because I've yanked you to the altar. You can't do it that way because the soul is not attached to the arm. Okay? The soul is the inner person. That is who makes the decision on whether or not they accept Christ. Yes, we pray for him. Yes, we ask God to give us wisdom. Yes, we ask God to give them a softer heart. God hardens the heart just like he did with Pharaoh, but he also softens it. We need to be focused on his glory during all that time. We need to be asking him for his glory to be seen. So when we repay words of hate with more words of anger, that's not what the Bible says to be doing. It says to show love. It says to show who Christ is, because that's where the hope is. The hope is not who can yell louder than the other. The hope is what really matters. And what matters is God's love. So, I'll skip that one. All right. 1 John 4, verse 20. That was an example just a moment ago where God said, nope, let's not even go there right now. It wasn't, it wasn't flowing with what he wanted. 1 John chapter 4, 20 through 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has actually seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love love his brother also. If we call ourselves Christians, we need to love each other. It is simple as that. And to show that love, then like I said, you can sit down, talk to people, you can show them, hey, you know what? Jesus cares about the whites, blacks, polka dotted, doesn't matter. He cares about each and every one of us because he died for each and every one of us. That's what his word says. There is neither neither Greek nor, nor Jew, no, nor slave, nor free man. None of that is involved in the equation as to whether or not you can accept Christ as your Savior. Everybody needs to have a chance to accept Christ as their Savior. And if they don't know who Christ is, that's our chance to speak up and talk to them. <clears throat> that's that's the message that he wanted us to hear today. That's the message he wants us to carry forth in our hearts when we talk to our coworkers about what's going on, when we talk to our family, when we talk to anybody else that has these concerns that are on 
social media or on Facebook or any of these other places on the news, whether it's about statues, race, or anything else in politics or in the social atmosphere, we still need to show love to bring forth the right point that God wants us to bring. As missionaries, that's the most effective way to do it. You don't walk into a new tribe and start yelling at them because they're wearing their clothes differently or have no clothes on at all. It means nothing to them, except that you're a loud person coming in into their area, and immediately you're going to be looked at as an outsider and perhaps killed. Same thing here. You don't walk in yelling at people that don't have the same kind of foundation that we have. Okay? You walk in and, and start asking questions, just like Paul did here when he was talking to the group in that particular city. He didn't walk in and start knocking down statues or monuments or anything like that just because he didn't agree with them. He walked in and started having conversation. He said, do you know who this God is that says the unknown God? We're going to tell you who this is. Let God change the heart, and he'll take care of the rest. If those statues need to come down in that city, they'll come down because the heart will change. When the heart changes, that's when the, the, the outside changes happen more permanently. Me dragging somebody to the altar is not going to change the heart. 